Awesome, thank you. So what I want to start out talking about is managing your caseload, and this has to do with your assigned clients in client track. Um, and the first way we can see those as soon as we log in, you can see that I'm on my home workspace here. And if I scroll down the page, I see this section that says my case assignments. So these are the clients that are assigned to your caseload inside client track and you are what client track calls the case manager on these clients record. I want to reiterate that that is regardless of your title at your organization. So you might not actually hold the title of case manager. You might be an intake specialist or an outreach specialist or whatever your title is. I'm a training coordinator, but in client track, I'm a case manager. That's just the name of the type of access that we give all of our HMIS users. So as a case manager um, on the client, that one is going to cause them to display here on this My Case Assignment section. Um, what's great about that is I can find the client here and then just use this arrow to really quickly go to this client's record in the system without having to search for them, which is really nice. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to click this button that says select this client and I'm going to be taken straight to their client dashboard. Um, super convenient. Of course, if you can search for that client in the system as well using their name or their client ID, if you have that information. Um, make sure I'm under the correct organization here. I am logged in under Dallas and Collin County's CAS. And that's fine. You can also see this page that I'm about to show you under your organization. Um, but I'm going to be doing some things related to CAS. So I'm going to go ahead and leave my organization as Dallas and Collin County's CAS. And I'm logged under under HMIS programs. So here from the client's dashboard, in my menu on the left under the profile section, I see this page called case managers. So I'm gonna click on that case managers page and you can see on this page, every active or inactive case manager that has been assigned to this client at some point in time. There's a few things I wanna point out about case manager assignments. They are tied to an enrollment in the system. So every time you enroll a client in a program, you are assigned as the case manager to that client for that enrollment if you're the person that's completing that intake in HMIS. So you can see here, I have completed a few different intakes for this client, and each time it assigned me as a case manager for that enrollment for that client. So the reason that these case manager assignments um, are directly related to CAS is that when you are assigned as the case manager on the, let me get a little feedback there. Um, when you are assigned as the case manager on the enrollment for coordinated entry for Dallas and Collin County's CAS, then you are going to receive notifications about that client status on the CAS queue. I'll say that again. When you are assigned as the case manager, for a client, for their Dallas and Collin County's CAS coordinated entry enrollment, then you are the person who's gonna receive notifications about that client's status on the CAS queue. So once every 90 days, right, that client is gonna need an update assessment and updated documentation. And this assigned case manager for the coordinated entry enrollment is who's gonna receive that notification that says, hey, it's been 83 days, you need to go in and do that update. Hey, it's been 90 days, your client's becoming inactive because you didn't do that update. Right, and um, additionally, these are the people who, if CAS admins do any sort of status review and send a manual notification to you all saying, hey, I reviewed this client's documentation and I see something that needs to be changed or maybe their CAS um, intake wasn't complete. If we're sending those manual notifications, they're also gonna go to this person. So it's really important that once you are enrolling your client into coordinated entry, you have, um, made sure that the correct person is assigned as a case manager on that client's enrollment. So I want to first look at um, where we do that assignment inside of the CAS intake workflow. And then we'll come back to this page at the end and look at how we can change and edit um, that case assignment if we need to after the client is already enrolled. But we're gonna start from scratch and I'm gonna find a test who is not that client that was already pulled up. Let's see. Looks like this client does not have a coordinated entry enrollment already, so that's perfect. We can use her. I am logged in under Dallas and Collin County's CAS, 
and I'm going to choose CAS and Diversion Intake Assessment to begin enrolling this client in Coordinated Entry. I'll use the current client and uh, clearly confirm that all of these required fields are there, that all this information is correct. Looks like we're missing a phone number which is required, so I'll enter that in. Um, this client is actually, I didn't check if this was the head of household. I'm going to cancel and find the head of household for this record. We'll start here. Sorry, y'all. Rewind. Start from scratch. Always make sure that you're on the head of household's record when you're enrolling a family in a program. That's pretty important. Here we go. All right, this is the head of household. This client has a phone number. It looks like all of these other required fields are entered. Of course, if this is your client, you want to sit down with them and make sure that all of this information is correct before you continue. Here on our family members page, we also want to go through the family members records and make sure that all of this information is correct and accurate in the system. I'm going to save and close. Here we come to our diversion assessment. I'm going to quickly fill out this field, um, these fields just to get us through the workflow. If you have any questions about diversion, um, now is a chance to ask them. So as I'm going through these questions, do you have any standing questions about um, this diversion assessment before we move on. Megan, someone put in the chat that they don't have the cast drop down. Okay, if you do not have access to Dallas and Collin County's cast, go ahead and submit a Spiceworks ticket for me. Um, requesting that access, we'll follow up and make sure that you've completed training and then I can get that access turned on for you. All right, I don't see any questions about diversion, so I'm going to go ahead and click save. Notice I'm not diverting this client, so I will be enrolling them in coordinated entry. Here I'm going to check the box next to um, all of the family members so that I can enroll them in coordinated entry. And this page is where we see the case manager being assigned. So here you can see that the system has automatically um, defaulted this case manager to me. I'm the user who's completing this enrollment. I'm the person who's going to be assigned as the case manager on this client's record. Again, that means that I am going to receive those notifications regarding that client status on the queue, and then I'm going to be able to see them on the My Case Assignments page of my home workspace as well, which we saw when we first started. So I can change the case manager from here if I need to. So let's say uh, Frida is actually the person who needs to be uploading these documents for this client following up with the client. She's actually going to be their case manager. I'm just doing the intake or putting the data in for her. I can, I'm sorry, I clicked without saying. I'm going to click on this um, little search icon here, this magnifying glass. And when I click, then I am given the option to find a new case manager. So I'm going to erase my name and search for the person who I need to assign this client to, which in this case, Frida, that's going to be you. So I'm going to type in Frida's name. Notice that the organization here is has to be Dallas and Collin County's CAS. So if the user does not have access to Dallas and Collin County's CAS, that may cause an issue with you being able to find them in the system. Um, also, it feels a little obvious, but just to drive the point home, this does have to be a user of HMIS. We can't assign a case manager inside of ClientTrack to someone who doesn't have access to ClientTrack. So if you're looking for a case manager, and they don't have HMIS access, you're going to have to choose a different person. Um, you'll have to figure out internally who that would be, right? So that's not necessarily, we can't tell you who that person would be. That's something that you're going to have to determine um, with internal policies. So I'm going to click search to find Frida in the system. Frida, you have so many training accounts. Uh, I am going to click on Frida's name, and then you can see that she has been reassigned as the case manager for our head of household, John Doe. But I also have a case manager that's assigned to every family member. So Jane Doe, this client's daughter, is also going to need a case manager assigned to her. I can keep it as myself um, or I can reassign that to the same person as well. I would say as a best practice, that should probably be the same person for the whole household. Um, but again, there's not a requirement there. That's going to be on an internal basis. So uh, when you're enrolling that client into CAS, you can choose a case manager right away as you're completing this intake. 
uh, right here from the HUD program enrollment page where you are choosing which family members to enroll in the program. You're making sure their project start date is accurate. And then you're also, um, you have the option to reassign that case manager from yourself if you need to. Once I click save, we'll continue through the rest of the workflow. And just so that this client is properly enrolled so that we can go back to their record, I'm gonna quickly complete this workflow for us um, and just enter some random information. Of course, if this was your client, you wanna make sure that you are entering correct information, sitting with them, going through the whole workflow, start to finish. And we'll come back to these pages of the workflow later to go over any other questions you have about those, so don't worry but I wanna get through them so that we can go back to this client's record and then see the case manager assignment that we just created. We're not gonna upload any documents at, at this time. I'm just trying to get to finish this workflow. So now I'm back on this client's dashboard. You can see their enrollment and coordinated entry. If I go to my menu on the left-hand side, um, remember I'm on my client's workspace, my client's dashboard. If I open up the profile menu here on my case managers page, now I can see that Frida is the active case manager for this client on their um, CAS enrollment. So this client has other enrollments where um, I'm the case manager or another training, um, training account is the case manager, is an inactive case manager actually which means that enrollment has probably been exited or deleted, uh, but Frida is now their active case manager on their coordinated entry enrollment. So she's gonna be the one getting those notifications about this client on the CAS queue. Uh, she's gonna be the one who is, um, you know, being reminded to go and do those update assessments, update those documents, uh, and she can see this client now on her dashboard, uh, on her home dashboard, if she goes to her My Case Assignment section. So let's say I assigned this client to Frida, but um, actually really it should just be me and I need to make an edit. I can easily edit this um, client's record from here. You shouldn't see this delete button. I have that because I'm an admin, um, but you will see this button that says edit case assignment. So if I click that edit case assignment button, here I have the option to enter uh, the beginning date of this assignment, which won't be earlier than the project start date of whatever uh, enrollment you're tying this to, so there are some limitations there. The ending date for this case assignment can be left blank to be open-ended, or you can choose to do it for a certain amount of time. Um, I would say to make sure you're getting the notifications that you need to for CAS, leave this open-ended so that you're not um, closing that case assignment and then the client has no one who's getting their notifications. Here in the case manager field, this works exactly the same way it did inside the intake. So I'll just click the search icon here and I can search for the user who I need to assign this to. I'm gonna search for myself, assign it back to me. And then this does have to be tied to an enrollment. So this is already tied to the coordinated entry enrollment because that's where we created this case assignment. We'll see in just a moment if you were creating a case assignment from scratch, you'll have to choose the enrollment to put in this field. And we wanna make sure that the status says active so that um, this the system is recognizing this, right, as an active case assignment. Um, inactive would mean that you're not getting any of those notifications that the system doesn't need to do anything with this. So we wanna make sure that that's active. And once I click save, we'll see now that client has been reassigned to me. So now I'm the person who's gonna be getting those notifications. Um, I also said we can add a case assignment from scratch from this page, right? So say we need to um, say more than one person needs to be on this case assignment. If I click the add case assignment button here, then we can we see this exact same screen. And like I said, the um, enrollment has not pre populated. So we'll have to select one. So if the client has multiple enrollments here, um, and you have access to that organization, you might be able to see, you know, if I was logged in as MDHA and they were enrolled in our MDHA training program, then I might be able to see that enrollment instead. So you can use this for your program enrollment as well as CAS. Uh, but if you're 
if you're under Dallas and Collin County's CAS, the only enrollment you should see is, is the CAS enrollment. So let's actually add Frida now as a separate case manager. And I'm going to leave the date the same. I'm going to make sure that that's active and say save. And now Frida and I are both case managers for this client's coordinated entry enrollment. So uh, if you're wondering how to help you manage those notifications, you're wondering how to make sure that you have those right clients um, assigned to your caseload, you, you can uh, go to the client's records to manage that at a client level. Again, from your home workspace here. So I'm going to go to my home workspace. Those clients who are assigned to you are going to show up in this My Case Assignment section of your home workspace. There are multiple pages here, so you may not see the client on this first page. You may have to um, use these buttons to navigate through multiple pages to find the client that you're looking for. Um, but this is going to allow you to see which clients you're assigned to their um, enrollment. It's going to show you which enrollment you're assigned to. So you can see for Jeremy here, I'm assigned as the case manager, not just for his coordinated entry enrollment, but also for the city square enrollment, also for this emergency shelter enrollment. So I have um, this client has multiple case assignments for each program that he's enrolled in. Any questions about those case assignments before we move on to our next topic? For HMIS team, was there anything we wanted to add there? Megan, I have a question. Sure. OK, on the case assignment, when you're signing it to more than one case manager, will both of them receive notification? I would say yes. Frida, will both of those people receive notifications? There should only be one person assigned to a case. OK, all right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Frida. Any other questions about case assignments before we move on? And I'm checking the chat. I don't see any questions in the chat either. Megan, before you move on, what was your client's name again, please? Let's see. Uh, it was John Doe, client 1374. So just a second. Got sure. It. Thank you. Mm hmm. Did you want me to hang out here for a minute while you look at that or am I? I'm, good to I'm sorry, Megan, I'm good. I didn't. I thought you heard me. Thank no, you. no, you're good. Um, the next topic that I want to go over is a, a known issue that we're having where um, the client is showing up multiple times in the CAS workflow. I don't have any instances of this in the training site. Um, Frida, if I record this, can I go back in and blur out the client's information to make the recording available, or should I stop recording for this part? What are you going to demonstrate, Megan? Uh, I want to go into Prod and show them that issue we're having with the workflow where the client is showing up multiple times in the um, intake. OK, and you have a specific client you're going to use? I was going to ask you for one. We don't have any in the training site, but I know you have some um, open tickets with that issue. Let me take a look, Megan. Sure. Your client ID. Give me just a moment. And if we can, I think if we can only use the client ID when we're talking about this client and then I can blur their name out on the recording, we can continue recording so that um, users who might not be in attendance today can see this issue and uh, know oh, how to troubleshoot. Yeah. I am looking for, a, I'm going into the ticket right now, Megan, so that I sure. can get a client ID. How about? There's a couple of people with their hand up as well.
Megan, how about 78411? 78411. All right. So again, I'm going to blur this client's name out in our recording before we publish this. But what I want to do is go into the coordinated entry workflow. I'm going to edit this workflow just to go through it and show you where this issue is. Um, so that if this comes up with your client, you can be aware that we are um, working on it currently. So I'm going to click on the action arrow and then click edit entry workflow. Uh, see no changes here. Save and close. I do want to point out um, this client has no family members, right? It's just them, just the single client. This diversion assessment. Um, Let's see, Frida, can you pull up this client's uh, most recent HUD enrollment maybe to, to give me this current living situation question? Sure thing, just one moment. Sure. Kira, I see your hand is raised um, and I know that you have an open ticket with me about your CAS access. Is that um, what you're hoping to get help with today or is there something else that I can help you with? No, there's something else. I got in using a diff the different website for HMIS yeah. client track, awesome. the bridge. Awesome. Um, give me just one second to finish showing this example, these examples, and then um, I'll get to your question. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Megan, prior living situation is going to be jail or prison. Um, let's say no. yeah, let's say no so that we can get through this workflow. All right, so again, this client is only displaying once on the enrollment page. I'm going to choose no changes. Um, and here we see our issue. So you can see that, uh, now beginning on this universal data assessment page, this client, ha uh, I'm going to be doing this intake for this client. And then if we look further down the page, once I get through the first part of this workflow, you see the client displaying again and then again later on in this workflow, like we're going to be enrolling them multiple times or like they're multiple different family members. So this is not occurring with every client. This seems kind of sporadic at the moment. We're looking into this issue and why this might be occurring for your client. Um, Frida, is there any guidance that the HMIS team wants to give users if they try to enroll a client and they see this happen in their workflow? What should they do? I honestly don't remember. I've only slept a couple of days since then. I so know. And you just got here this morning. Yeah. Um, if you're not able to get through the workflow, um, I want to point out, I just want to reiterate that notice on your progress menu that the client appears twice. So what the system is doing, it's essentially, I'm going to say looping, right? So it's asking you the same questions for that single person, um, that single head of household twice. Um, so my recommendation to you is to um, attempt to get through the workflow by answering the questions exactly as they should be answered and see if you can get through the workflow. If you cannot get through the workflow, then I would ask that you place a help desk ticket for us and giving us the client ID number and simply stating that the client is um, appearing um, twice within the workflow or duplicated within the workflow. And I will tell you that I'm checking the status of this because I did report this to you, Cobia, um, last week. And as of right now, I do not have an update on it. I'm looking at the status and there is not an update on that. But if you place a ticket, then I'll be able to give you an update um, because typically what Ecovia will do will apply a fix for us in like our development environment. And I can let you know the progress on having that issue resolved. So again, attempt to get through the workflow. If you cannot get through the workflow, place a help desk ticket for us and I will provide you with a status update. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I've logged back out of the production site. We're gonna go back into training because this next issue I can replicate in the training site. 
Um, and we might camp on this issue for a second. So this has to do with um, if the client has an existing VI SPDAT in the system, uh, if you'll remember that in the CAS workflow, the VI SPDAT is built in as an option in the workflow. And so the system is, um, we're working with Ecovia on, on correcting this issue because um, the build is not exactly what we want it to be right now. But we're going to take a look at a client who has an existing VI SPDAT and um, see this page that the workflow is giving you and give you some instructions on how to complete this so that you can get through the workflow because right now it's kind of blocking some of you from completing the workflow. Before I go into the client's record, I do want to point out on our um, HMIS training site, so I can put this link in the chat for you all, um, but it is on our website under um, the HMIS training page here in the menu, HMIS training resources. If you scroll down, you'll see all of those cheat sheets that we have available for you, um, your cash cheat sheets. And I've put this one under FAQ because this is not a permanent thing. We're hoping that this is just a workaround until we can fix this issue. Um, but I'm going to give you this link directly. And it was in your email that I sent you this morning for, um, for the office hours as well, the link straight to this document. But I'm going to actually just put this document in the chat for you so that you can save it, have access to it. Um, and there's a video that goes along with this. These are temporary instructions as a workaround until we can fix this issue. So if you want to pull up this document and follow along with me, these are the instructions that I'm going to be following. You don't need to frantically take notes. They're all written down for you in that document. So let me find my client who has an existing VI SPDAT and uh, what I'm going to do is, you can see this client is not currently enrolled in coordinated entry. I'm going to enroll this client in coordinated entry. Um, and I'll just point out on the screen, she already has a VI SPDAT that's been recorded with a score of 14. So I'm logged in under Dallas and Collin County's CAS. Uh, under the CAS section of my menu, I'm going to go to CAS and Diversion Intake. We're going to use the current client and I'm going to quickly uh, just click through this CAS workflow to get this client enrolled in coordinated entry. Again, of course, you want to make sure that these um, questions are true and accurate for your client um, based on the day you're talking to them. The way I click through this workflow is not an example or a model of how it should be done every time. I, I know you all know that, but I feel like I have to say it. There's that case manager assignment um, option if we want to change that. Of course, check that the project start date is accurate as well. Oh, of course she is. All right, so I'm just going to enroll the head of household because I think I've been playing around with this client and um, maybe deleted the client's previous enrollment, but not the family members, which is my fault. going to save and close through all of these um, other pages just so we can get to the VI SPDAT page. And hopefully the system does what we expect it to. Yes. So this is the page um, that we are seeing in the workflow right now where some users are getting stuck depending on how they answer this question. So notice that, um, remember, I'm enrolling my client in coordinated entry for the first time. There already was a VI SPDAT recorded inside HMIS for this client. And so the page says, um, typically we would see a VI SPDAT here. But right now the page says um, the last VI SPDAT was recorded on this date. Has one of the following occurred for this client? They were housed and returned to homelessness or one of these major events. Um, they've been hospitalized multiple times, threatened or attempted to harm themselves or someone else, a new mental health or substance use diagnosis, or the family has changed. So right now, um, users are looking at this list of questions and saying, no, nothing has changed. If I click no, that's going to force me into a SPDAT, which is the next um, page of this workflow. So I'm not going to do that. Well, I will. I'll show you guys what it does. If I click no, then um, I'm forced to complete a SPDAT. We're not using the SPDAT to prioritize and match clients. 
Um, and so what happens is you get to this page and then you're stuck because you're not ready to do a spit at, you don't want to do a spit at, you don't need to do a spit at, and you can't go backwards um, and get out of the spit at, you're stuck here. So if this happens, um, I know a few of you, this has happened already. You've been um, stuck in this workflow and we've just said, you're gonna have to cancel the workflow and start over, unfortunately. So that was the example of what not to do. Um, answering no to that question, even if that's accurate, even if none of those things have happened, answering no results in this workflow that's just not accurate. It's not what we wanna see. So instead, um, when we go through, let's see if I edit, if it will allow me to, or if I'm gonna have to totally, I think I need to totally delete it and start over. But let's see. Here we go. So if I go back and edit the workflow, um, it's giving me this page again, which is great. It means we don't have to delete the enrollment and start again from scratch. Uh, what's in the instructions on this document that I sent you today and is also on our website and what's in this video that you'll have here. Even if the answer to this question is no, we're going to need you to answer yes. So no matter what the actual situation is for the client, the workaround right now, while the system is not working the way we're expecting it to, we need you to answer yes to this question. Answering yes, as you can see, is gonna push you into the VI SPDAT, which is what we want the workflow to do. And it's gonna pre-populate all of those um, answers that the client, that you've already recorded for the client's VI SPDAT whenever it was recorded, or it should. Um, it doesn't look like it, it looks like the score might be different. So I'm a little concerned by that. Um, our guidance right now is that you should not have to make any edits on this page. The system should be pulling in the most recent um, answers. And you will need to choose placed on prioritization list. And um, this is kind of the big reason why we need to answer yes to that question, because the page for the SPDAT that we were pushed into when we answered no, does not have this option and this is how you get your client on the queue. So we want to check and make sure that this field is answered, placed on prioritization list. We don't want to touch anything else on this existing VI SPDAT and we'll click save. Once we finish our workflow, we can see our client's CAS enrollment. Um, we want to go to the CAS queue and make sure that the client's VI SPDAT score is accurate and then you can submit a SpiceWorks ticket if it's not. Um, if it's not accurately displaying that VI SPDAT score that you're expecting to see. So again, that's a workaround for right now. Um, I've put the link to this document in the chat. You also have it in the email that you received this morning if, if you got my email about office hours. If you didn't get my email uh, and you wanna be on our contact list for CAS, send me your um, email address in the chat so that I can get you on that list. Any questions about that workaround? Um, I know it's not the most convenient thing, but it's it's the uh, it's what's going to work for us now while we're fixing that issue. Thank you, Trisha. I'll get you added in there. All right, so that is um, my list of topics to bring to you all from the team. Doesn't seem like we have any questions about any of those. So at this point, we're gonna kind of transition and um, take your questions. So it looks like we have a question in the chat. Are we able to prioritize clients who were caught in the transition? Um, Stephanie, I'm gonna to toss this one to you and your team to discuss how clients are being prioritized. Are you still with us? I am, what was the question again? I'm sorry. Uh, Sylvia asked in the chat, are they able to prioritize clients who were kind of caught in the middle of our cash transition? Have they been enrolled in the DCC CAS?
So, yeah, we can hear you. Um, she's saying yes, Stephanie. I don't see a reason why you can't um, prioritize the client. Do you have the client's um, the ID number? Is there something specifically going on? Well, she's while well, Sylvia's grabbing that client ID number to put in the chat for Stephanie. Um, this is a great topic. Um, I'm catching up on email, so this came across my email. Um, we're finding a lot. We're finding several um, clients who have two CAS enrollments. Um, MDHA has created a CAS enrollment, right? And then the agency has created a CAS enrollment. So um, us as HMIS admins, we're going in and we're deleting one of those CAS enrollments. So I am going to um, lean, I'm going to ask Alex Abraham, um, if you're here, if you could just remind everyone here of um, what clients they should be enrolling because there's a list of clients that MDHA um, was do we're calling it HPL data entry. So MDHA, we were um, any client that was on the HPL prior to us going live um, in HMIS or prior to us doing any training in HMIS, right? Um, all of those clients that were on the HPL, MDHA has, we're doing those enrollments on your behalf. So there's, um, you do not have to go in and create those enrollments. If you're not for sure if you should create a CAS enrollment for your client, if that client is on the HPL or not, all you have to do, ladies and gentlemen, is simply look for that client, search for your client in HMIS, which you should always search for a client before you create an enrollment. You should always search for a client before you create an enrollment. Because when you search for a client before you create an enrollment, you have a chance to look at that client's dashboard and see what's going on with that client, right? To see if they have any enrollments at any other agencies. Are they being serviced? Um, are they staying in an emergency shelter? Are they receiving services from a street outreach program? Are they already in a housing program? So you always want to take a look at that client's record First, search to see if that client has an existing record. If they do, go to the client's dashboard. Let's look and see what's going on with that client. If that client already has a CAS enrollment, there's no need for you to create a new enrollment for that client. Um, but I will ask Alex Abraham to weigh in on that period when we started training agencies back in May, we started training our access points. How does an agency know if they should create an enrollment for their client or if MDHA is going to do that? We know that they should look at the client's record to see if they have an existing enrollment, but Alex, if you could weigh in and let us know where you are on HPL data entry, I think that that may be helpful. So we do have um, some clients that are still being enrolled into the queue that were previously already on the HPL. I uh, can't say exactly how many are missing. Um, that's something that the uh, other members of the team are taking care of. Um, but if you can't find your client, um, you can reach out to MDHA to find out if they're about to have their enrollment done or if you can create the enrollment instead. Um, but we, if you are creating that enrollment, we would want you to backdate it for when they were enrolled into the coordinated access system. So that's originally their initial DOP state um, that we were using on the previous HPL, and their documents need to be also uploaded into the system as well. If they um, are not, they won't be able to make any referral to any project. So we will be verifying that information on our end uh, under status review. Um, but yeah, there are, still clients that are being enrolled and so if you have a question about maybe one of your particular clients you can reach out to us and find out um, if they need to be uh, if they're supposed to be enrolled by us or not alex abraham is there a clear date that we could provide that we can um that we can tell folks on the call here today you know, is it is it June 1st? Is it, you know, as of um, and forgive me, you all, I don't remember what day we provided the the training for access points. 
We t when we done that training, we asked um, access points. We trained them and then we said by this date, right? Um, we will no longer take, um, you know, Spiceworks requests for clients to be placed on the HBL because we expect you as the agency to do the CAS enrollment. It, was there a specific cutoff date for that? For clients that ask MDHA to add someone to HPL? Yes. Yeah, as of um, May 27th is when we said we would no longer start um, continue accepting Spiceworks tickets for clients to be added to the HPL when access points were trained. So are we safe to say that May 27th, any client um, that was requested to be placed on the HPL as of May 27th, um, any clients prior to May 27th, MDHA will take care of those enrollments so the provider doesn't have to do that enrollment. And then any clients after um, May 27th, we expect the access point to, to do the CAS enrollment. Correct. If they were already enrolled in the, in the coordinate entry system through the CAS before May 27th, MDHA will be taking care of them. If they are coming to your agency and they were not enrolled, into CAS, then you would be expected to enroll that client into CAS. And if you have a particular client you want some maybe um, additional feedback on, if they're going to be enrolled by MDHA or not, you can reach directly out to uh, you can reach directly out to Samantha. She's leading that um, transition data entry. So we have a few members on our team that are taking care of that, and she's um, overseeing that project. Alex, this is Hartfield. While you are still on, the clients that you, your team um, is going in and adding and doing the enrollments for, and then we're starting to see that um, users are also creating the duplicate enrollments. When they go in, when we're asking them to go in and make sure that they check the client's record first to make sure that there is not already a CAS enrollment, is there? They see the enrollment. Is there any additional things that you want them to look at, make sure documentation is correct? Are they doing anything with that existing enrollment that you all have already created on behalf of them? Or are they just saying, oh, my client's good and we, is there some additional things that they need to be looking at, checking when they already see an enrollment created? Uh, if it's one of your clients that you've been working with and was they were prioritized before the transition, I would say you would want to check to make sure all their documents are uploaded. Um, MDHA staff went through Basecamp and also um, HMIS to make sure that all documents that were included for each client were are in the document check and also client files for critical documents. But I would uh, emphasize that if you have a client that you're working with, you make sure that all their documents are in the system. Um, whether that's um, document checker client files. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure everyone knew, you know, don't just see an enrollment and then just move on. Make sure you kind of look at it and assess it, and make sure um, that everything is needed for your client. Thank you, Alex. Mm -hmm. And to add to that, um, your client would not be approved to be referred to an agency until they have an ID on file, um, a state issued ID, um, not a copy of a paper ID, not um, a bridge ID or anything like that. Your client would not be referred to a program unless they have an actual state issued ID on file, as well as a completed VI SPDAT assessment and additional uh, documentation of homelessness, as well as that uh, certification of disability if they are um, going to be prioritized to a permanent supportive housing housing intervention. Thank you, Stephanie, and that is different than what we originally had in training. There were some um, decisions made in the CAS work group since we trained where we originally said we might refer clients without um, IDs and, and those types of critical documents but that has changed. So that's a good update as well. Um, Kira, I see your hand is raised. What is your question? How can we help? 
Hi. Uh, yeah, we're doing the veterans blitz right now. Just wondering, what do we know? We need. What do we need to know about cast enrollments with veterans? We saw that there was a question about veteran students, and it was just a yes or no question. We clicked yes, and that was it. There was no follow up questions. So I will let the HMIS team chime in here in, in addition to what I know about the workflow um, off the top of my head. Uh, I'm not as familiar with the veteran questions just off the top of my head, but I, I know for sure um, your best practice is going to be answer that question as honestly as you can. I know you guys are doing that veteran blitz today, so clearly answer yes if, if those clients are veterans and we're wanting to, we're wanting to track that data. Um, I believe that you should see questions later on in the workflow regarding that um, client's veteran status um, and their experience as a veteran, you know, maybe what, um, you know, branch of the military they were in, those sorts of questions. So if you get those questions, um, just answer them the same way you would typically answer them if you're going through an intake with a client. So ask the client the questions if you're able to. Um, if you're not able to collect that data, if you're not able to ask that question, then you would choose data not collected. If you ask and the client doesn't know or they can't answer that question, they refuse to answer that question, then you're going to record those answers. Um, but I know that the, you know, especially in the Blitz, uh, and this goes for everyone in, in or outside of the Blitz, right? This goes for everyone. Maybe you're doing that enrollment and um, you say yes to that veteran question, but then you don't have the other answers that populate in the workflow. Just answer them the same way you typically would answer any question for HMIS data. If you have the data, put it in. If you didn't get to ask the question, choose data not collected, and we can try to follow up at a later date. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for working the Blitz today. We appreciate you guys out there. Thanks. Um, there was another question in the chat, and thank you for putting it in there, ma'am. I know we talked earlier, and I was going to bring it as well. Um, Stephanie, this question is for you or Alex Abraham. If a client was referred previous to the transition, um, and that, that referral needs to be sent back, how are you asking that users send those referrals back to you if they weren't originally referred inside HMIS prior to the transition? Through a, um, a SpiceWorks ticket. Just let awesome. us know. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? What other questions do you guys have for us? Megan, did you go over? I know that we had a lot of questions about incomplete when they're getting these notifications or they're seeing that things are incomplete. Uh, did we talk about what that means and how they can? Do we already talk about that? Maybe we already did. No, we haven't. That's a great one. Um, I see Caitlin's hand in the chat. So, Caitlin, I'm going to take Caitlin's question, Hartfield, and then let's come back to that topic. I think that's a great one. Caitlin, what's your question? Hey, so when I'm enrolling a family into CAS, I'm noticing that after I enroll, the head of household and I move on to like the child, it's skipping over the universal and going straight into the barriers. And so I was wondering if that is a known issue or um, if there's some kind of something that I'm doing wrong on my end. Well, thank you for your question. That's a great question. And I'm, I feel like everyone in the HMIS team just pulled up the system to try to test the workflow. Okay. Um, would you submit a ticket for that issue, Caitlin? Because I want to be able to track it and get back to you. I know that we're not going to have an answer for you like in the next 30 seconds on this call, but I want to be able to follow up and tell you, um, okay. Frida. I, I I think my question is, yes, we want you to submit a ticket. Um, is it Caitlin who asked the question? Yes, it is. Caitlin, I want you to submit a ticket um, with a client ID for me, just so that we can make sure that we are thoroughly addressing the issue. Um, but there are some questions that are only required for clients that are 18 or older. One, a um, prior living situation is an example of a universal um, data element that's only required for clients who are 18 or older and head of households. 
Mm -hmm. So right. you wouldn't see that question for someone under the age of 18. Right, and so what I'm seeing happening, um, because you know, part of the universe also includes whether or not they have health insurance um, or a disability. So I'm not seeing okay. that page for the children. Um, okay. It skips straight to their barriers. Okay. And so Thank in you. order for me to collect that data, I have to click back onto the previous um, member that I'm enrolling and it'll, um, it'll go back to that previous member's barriers and I'll be able to save and close and then it pulls up the universal for the next member. Gotcha. So it's there, but it's, it's the form is within the workflow, but for whatever reason, as you initially move forward, it's skipping. And so you're having to go back to complete it. Correct. Okay. If you just would be so gracious as to give us a, an example of a um, client ID for the head of household, and then we will make sure that we have that resolved for you. Okay. And then I'm also noticing when I, um, like if once I enroll them into CAS and then I go into like our agency program to enroll them, the head of household, like when I'm trying to default, it's not doing it for the head of household um, on that universal information. It will only do it after, like for the rest of the family unit. If that makes sense. Megan, am I correct? Refresh my memory in that the universe that the universal data assessment is the only um, set of questions that doesn't allow you to default last assessment. My current understanding would be that prior living situation doesn't default, but I would think that barriers would. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's something that we would need to go in and look at to make sure. Um, I would expect the barriers to default. I think that's a helpful thing to default uh, from the previous enrollment. But then I know that prior living situation does not. You do still need to enter that one manually every time. Right. So again, it's like the health insurance and disability and then the barriers um, that I'm act like I'm not seeing that they default. And Caitlin, gotcha. what I hear you saying is that you're creating your CAS enrollment first and then enrolling your client into your program and you're not able to default last assessment. Yes. OK. Ticket with client ID number, please. And thank you. And yes. I wish I had an answer for you right now. <laughs> No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin, for your question and for submitting those tickets. We appreciate it. Um, does anyone else have a question that we can address directly before we I, I do want to address the topic that Hartfield brought up, which is the incomplete documentation status and what that means and what your next steps are. Um, Bridget, I see your hand. What question do you have? Yes, Megan. Um, I'm not sure if it's specific to CAS, but I've been receiving several reminders in HMIS, and I'm not quite sure what to do with them. Can you give us an example of one of the notifications that you're receiving? Sure. Um, it would be the date and time, the individual's name, HMIS number, is scheduled to become inactive on X date. Um, and, but like I said, they have increased over the last uh, well, this week, over the last three days. So I want to make sure that I'm I'm acting on them accordingly, um, but I don't know how or what to do with them. Sure, that's a great question. So those, uh, I'm going to share my screen. Give me just a moment. Those notifications, you should be receiving those notifications for clients who appear on your My Case Assignment section of your home dashboard. So I'm logged into Client Track. I'm on my home dashboard. And if I just scroll down on that home dashboard, I see My Case Assignments. Mm -hmm. These are the clients who um, you are assigned as a case manager in the system to that client's enrollment. So for those clients who have an enrollment in Coordinated Entry in CAS, uh, if you are assigned as a case manager to that client's coordinated entry enrollment, then you will receive those notifications about the client status on the queue. So that notification that says um, is scheduled to become inactive, that notification is sent 
83 days after the client's most recent um, document has been updated in the system. Uh, so that's kind of like your notification that's saying, hey, your client is coming up on this 90 day mark. You need some sort of activity on the client's CAS enrollment for the client to stay active on the queue or HPL and be available for a referral. So that scheduled to become inactive is the system asking you to go in and complete an update assessment for that client and, and update documentation for that client in the system. That's what should be happening. Um, I know that we had an ongoing issue in the past where users were receiving that notification for clients who were not enrolled in coordinated entry. So if you go to that client ID that you're getting on that notification and see that that client does not have a coordinated entry enrollment, um, Frida, are we still submitting tickets with those clients? Are you still tracking that issue? What's the issue? Where users were receiving notification. Sorry, Hartfield. I said I got that issue. Um, <clears throat> we are still working on that. So who who may who had the question? Bridget, Bridget. Fraser. Yes, ma'am. Bridget, um, if um, these clients are not your clients, um, and these clients do not have a CAS coordinated entry enrollment, then I would like you to submit a ticket, um, and you can just take a screenshot of the notifications that you're getting and let us know that these are not your clients or they're not enrolled in CAS. Um, that is an ongoing issue that we're working with our vendor on um, that has not been completed. And so I'm still making sure that I'm sending in um, documentation for that. Um, so are these clients that you're seeing yours or not? More than likely not. Um... Right. OK. Yeah, we're seeing that this is more than likely an error for for people not. So um, if you could just submit me a ticket, take a screenshot, make sure you don't have any PII or PPI on whatever screen you're on um, and just just a, a blanket statement that, you know, these are not um, these are not clients that I'm a case manager of or on my caseload so that I can add it to that ticket that's open. So anybody else that's receiving these notifications that aren't yours, um, just know that we're working on it and there's nothing for you to do at this time. Now, again, if it's what Megan said, this is your client that is with cash, you are the case manager, then those notifications are there for a reason so that you're able to get your documentation uploaded. Um, but if these are not your clients and they do not have a cash enrollment, um, then this is an error that we are working through currently. Okay, this is Jackie over at Track, and I also receive those messages. I normally get about 50, 60 clients. None of those clients are mine. Uh, occasionally, I may have a client on there. That, that client is actually already an active client with me for years. Uh, and so how do we, I mean, what I try to do is just go in and hit dismiss, but it don't stay dismissed. It comes back <laughs> periodically so, during my process. I mean, let me just show you guys really quickly. This is the email that Bridget and Jackie are talking about. This is the most common one that I've seen um, this error happening with. So this is the email you'll receive from ClientTrack that says, hey, case manager, your client is scheduled to become inactive on this date. The following is needed to keep the client active on the HPL. An, up, an updated third-party letter, which is documentation that's going in CAS document check, and then an update assessment in ClientTrack that update assessment is going to be done on the coordinated entry enrollment, and both of those things are required to keep the client active on the list. So the purpose of this message for your clients who are enrolled in CAS is to let you know that that 90 day um, mark is coming up soon. So you can see I got this email today about this client who's going to be inactive one week from now. Um, so the purpose of it is to be helpful, and I know that it's frustrating to get all those notifications for clients that aren't yours. I also want to show you, um, I don't have any notifications currently popping up on my screen, but if I go to my notification bell here, I can see several different types of notifications that I've received in the system, and I'm going to pull up one that says scheduled to become inactive just to show that to you all. Um, when I click on that notification, uh, I can scroll down and see like uh, all the different alerts that are set up for it. So if you scroll down, if you open a notification, and scroll down on this page. If you see a bunch of alerts set up under this section, you can remove all of those alerts and that might help you with that dismiss issue. Um, I know I always just click 
dismiss all because I don't have any clients that I'm managing on my case record. So that's easy for me. So I understand that you guys can't do that because um, you do need to review all of those. But that alert setup at the bottom of that notification, once you open it up, you should be able to um, remove those alerts if you need to so that they're not coming back every couple of days. Um, so what, what you would want to do, whether it's this email um, or the notification inside client track, here in the email, the client ID is in the title of this email. Um, in the notification and client track, it's here in the message. You can see my client's name and then their client ID. You are going to want to take that client ID. I'm just going to copy that and then go to that client's record in the system to see, is this client enrolled in CAS? Are they one of your clients and do you need to do the assessment for them or um, is this an error? So for this client, Shirley Hannah, uh, it looks like this client doesn't have any CAS enrollment. So this notification would be one of those errors. Um, for this client, 459, let's see. Megan, I have a question. I'm sorry to interrupt. You're fine. Go ahead. So that we would go in and enroll the person, or excuse me, the person does not have an enrollment in CAS. How can we confirm that that person has should not, excuse me, should be enrolled, but has not been enrolled yet? I would not take this notification as a sign that your client should be enrolled in CAS. Okay. Um, if I want to word this correctly here. Um, if your client should be on the HPL, then they should be enrolled in CAS. Okay. So if you are getting that notification for clients who maybe say they've, um, you know, if you're like a housing program, you've already gotten the referral from CAS and you're getting this notification randomly on a client who's not on the HPL, you don't need them to be on the HPL, then that's an error, right? Um, if your client needs to be on the HPL, then they need to have a CAS enrollment uh, on their record. So I, I don't know if there's any other anything that um, the CAS team wants to add to that to determine should a client be enrolled in CAS or not. So Bridget, if you're looking at your notifications and everyone, if you get a notification and you're seeing that these are clients that you do not work with, um, you don't know if they're supposed to have a CAS enrollment because you are not their case manager, they haven't been enrolled in your program, um, then again, those are the errors that we're looking at. Um, Bridget, if you see a client that is your client that's coming up, giving you this notification that they're going to become inactive, but you go to their, their dashboard and you see that there is not a case um, there is not a CAS um, enrollment, then that warrants a ticket, right? So that we can, the CAS team can look and see, is this a client that's on their list of their data, back data entry that they still need to enroll? And for whatever reason, the system is kicking out the air, you know, kicking it out. Um, but those are really the only two things you need to do with those notifications. Are these your clients? If they're your clients and they are enrolled, then the error may be correct or the notification may be correct that you're coming up on your 83 and 90 and you need to make sure you do an update assessment these clients are not yours right um so that's just it, it's the system's kicking out an error to you and there's nothing for you to do with it um until we get it resolved and that you all i know it's annoying to look at but um until we get it resolved they'll they'll be popping up and then um or you're getting the notification, it is your client, you go to the record, there's no case uh, involvement, right? So it's just a matter of knowing what to do if it, if it is or isn't your client. Okay. All right, thank you so much that for that, ladies. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you for your question, Bridget. Um, so I just wanna point out, we looked at the one client from my notification up here at the notification bell that was not my client, they did not have a CAS enrollment. Um, this one that I just pulled from this email that I received, it looks like this client does have a coordinated entry enrollment. And if you look at the project start date, um, that was a while ago, right? 83 days ago, actually, which is when we expect to get this notification at the 83 day mark if there has not been an update. So um, this client that I got this email for in this scenario, this is a legitimate notification. This client has been enrolled in coordinated entry. Um, they do have an active CAS enrollment. 
And it looks like they are coming up on 90 days of being enrolled with no uh, no activity on their record. So I would need to then go in to my action arrow, do an update assessment for this client on their CAS enrollment, and then I would also need to go to CAS document check and upload documentation. Bridget, I have a question. Um, because the notifications that are coming within the system that are not your clients, you're not getting an email like um, Megan just showed, are you? Um, very few and far between. Um, the most, the majority of them come through via the reminders and or the okay. bell in HMIS. Okay, but, um, but okay, but you're also getting the email for clients that you're not the case manager for, correct? Correct. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. I know that that's frustrating, y'all, to log in and see all those notifications and to not know which ones are legitimate and which ones are errors. Um, so we are working with them on on fixing that issue. Um, until then, I would just, especially for the emails that you're getting, because I think I get more notifications in the system than I get emails. Um, look at those client IDs or those client names to see, like Hartfield said, is it your client? If it's not your client, that's an error. You don't need to do anything. If it is your client, are they enrolled in coordinated entry? And do you need to update their documentation and perform an update assessment? All right, we have about um, 15 more minutes. What other questions do we have from any other users who might have joined? Marsha, are you on the call? Hale? I thought I saw her on earlier. I'm here. Okay, Marsha, could you please, because um, this is probably something that's across the board, um, about your incomplete, the ticket you submitted um, earlier, asking about please help what's incomplete about your family member. What prompted you to submit that ticket? What did you receive? What did you see that prompted you to ask that question? Because I think that's something that's across the board. Yeah, so it was really incomplete, and I noticed I had the DOH, but Stephanie just mentioned the ID need to be um, uploaded as well. So I don't know if that was an issue, but um, what yeah, did you receive? What, yeah. what what gave you notice that this client was incomplete? Did you get an email? Did you get a a, a notification? What made you realize that this? Family well, was I I want to say when I went in, I can't, when I went into the queue just to check and see. You know if they have been referred and it said incomplete okay so that's good so megan stephanie if we can go through i know the last few days we've had a lot of conversation around this incomplete and what it means um so if you or stephanie yeah. kind of explain to them what that means um some are getting emails saying you know such and such is incomplete some are seeing it on the queue so i just want them to better understand what they're looking for Thank you, Hartfield. I know I keep saying we're going to circle back to that question, so I appreciate you bringing it back to our attention. Um, I'm going to pull up the CAS queue so that we can look at the queue and see where that status is displaying. But Stephanie, do you want to um, give a little more information about, um, I don't think we need to go into the details of the status review and how it works, but what types of messages are users going to be receiving from you once you do status review and what actions might they need to take based on those messages that you're sending in the system? So I think right now we need to figure out when I send over like a notification or an alert and I put that message in there, what documentation they'll need when I change the um, CAS intake status to incomplete documentation, I don't think they're getting that notification along with that uh, email about the incomplete documentation for their client. So I think that's something that is an issue right now because I am sending them a notification that says, hey, there's no ID on file. There's we need additional documentation to determine that the client is eligible for a PSH intervention. We don't I don't think they're getting that information. When I send that over um, in an, in the notification, so I think that's what the issue is with a lot of what's going on right now. The CASQ, they're not getting that notification along with 
that email. So Stephanie, while we work with Acovia, right, to figure out um, if and how what you are putting in when you what you are writing in gets back to the user so that, that there's no confusion about exactly what is needed. Um, what is a workaround that you propose at this time when users are seeing that their clients are inactive, I mean, have incomplete data and they don't know what, what would you like for them to do? Basically, make sure that if you're in, if you're at answering on the HUD assessment that your client um, is going to, you know, need a, a PSH housing intervention, the normal documentation for PSH is a COD, which is Certification of Disability, um, at least one year of homelessness, and a completed VI SPDAT, as well as that state-issued ID. Just make sure that all of that is uploaded under the CAS uh, document check. And if you if you have all that uploaded on your CAS document check, you shouldn't be getting anything that shows incomplete documentation. Or if it's an, a rapid rehousing intervention, um, just make sure that the ID is uploaded um, as well as that VIAS for that is complete and that they do have a, either a current living situation entered into um, client track or that they have documentation of homelessness uploaded in the system or they have some bed stays or open enrollments in the system that shows that they are currently homeless. So as long as all of that is uploaded and, and, and showing in client track and I can go in there and see it, that's what every client in, in client track needs to have as far as documentation in that DCC CAS enrollment that needs to be in the system as well. That's awesome. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, you're welcome. And just remember you all, if you are going in and all of those things that Stephanie mentioned for your rapid rehousing and your PSH are uploaded and you're still seeing that your client is coming up as incomplete, then at that time it warrants a ticket, right? So that we can do a better look into what is going on. But please be sure to do your due diligence, like Stephanie said, on the the two types of documents that are needed. Um, Stephanie and Megan, is there a cheat sheet on on this that all the stuff that Stephanie said because it's very great information and it's really easy to get mixed up with what is needed for what. Um, so if there's not a document, I think that that would be a, a good time to maybe create one for the users um, as what's needed for PSH and rapid rehousing. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I think now that we have that um, determined more clearly than we maybe did a couple weeks ago, we can definitely get some information out there. Awesome, thank you. Anyone on the call have any questions um, surrounding what is needed um, in order for your um, ref your clients to not be incomplete? Okay, I'm done taking over, Megan. Not taking over, you're helping. I appreciate it, Hartfield, appreciate you. What other um, questions do we have, you all? I think this has been a really great um, informative session from my perspective. I hope that y'all feel that way. What else can we help you all with today? Does anyone on the call have an open ticket about CAS that they would like to um, go ahead and ask their question now while we're here on the call? I was going to ask um, Tyler a question from Promise House. Sure. Tyler, are you, are you here? No. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. I know he was on here at some point. Yeah. Is anyone on from Promise House? I don't think so. Okay. I had a question about a referral to their um, their pro project, but I'll just send him an email. 
Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Stephanie. I will say um, I spoke to a user this morning who I'm going to be looking into this issue more. It was like right before this call, so I haven't been able to, to troubleshoot or give any more details, but um, it looked like an issue where the check-ins and reservations were not functioning properly. So I know that that's um, for you housing providers that are on the call. We're asking you to keep that housing inventory up to date in HMIS to check those clients in and out of units when um, when they're moving in. So if you are concerned that the number of available slots uh, on your facility are incorrect based on what you've put into the system, then please submit a ticket for that. I'm not sure how pervasive that issue is right now. Like I said, I haven't really had a chance to look into it much. Um, Again, we're not taking SpiceWorks tickets just to say I have open slots or I don't have open slots. We want to be able to use the system for that. But if something you're seeing in the system is incorrect, you've tried to enroll the, you've tried to check the clients into into a unit, and you can't for whatever reason, um, or you have all the clients checked in, but for some reason available slots are still showing. Those types of system issues where we've tried to use the system to do what we are expecting it to do and it's not. Um, submit a SpiceWorks ticket for that so that we can look into that for you. Um, I want to stress the importance of being on those HPL uh, calls on Thursday so that you can vouch for your clients, so that you can um, be communicating about those open slots, when new slots are going to be coming available soon, if they're not quite yet ready. Um, Stephanie, if you want to give any more detail then you can. It looks like Tyler's back. Tyler, Stephanie had a question for you um, if you're available. But yeah, I, I want to stress the importance of those HPL meetings as well, because I know um, if you're on this call, you're probably already on those meetings. But it is important that we're able to be on there um, collaborating as a community to make sure we're staying in communication about all those clients. Um, Tyler, does your does your project accept anyone that is um, at risk of homelessness or do they have to be literally homeless? Uh, I was happy to be literally homeless. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, no problem. All right, let's see. I think we got rid of that feedback. Um, any other questions for us? We have five more minutes. Any other questions or any open tickets? Marsha has a question in the chat, Megan. Oh, thank you. Let's see, Marsha's question. I did have a concern at one time when I attempted to complete the VI SPDAT, the family option was not available. Um, but for the client, it is. So, Marsha, can you give me a little more information, maybe the client ID, so I can um, take a look at that client for you? Um, so, I will attempt to complete a VASPA that, and then when I go in there to have that option, the, the family option was not available. But then when I switch to attempt to complete the assessment with another, it is, so it, I don't know if anyone's had the concern. Um, Marsha, uh, make sure that we understand. Are you saying that you go into, say, your head of household for your family's record and you go to VI and there's not a family option maybe under your head of household, but when you switch to, say, another family member within that household, then the family VI is an option? The No, the, the VS for that is not available under the head of household. But if I switch to a whole new client, a whole new client to complete the VASPDA, it is available. Um, is the client that you're under, I mean, I guess, it, uh, is it a family? Yes. Yeah. And you're saying that when you go to the bottom at VASPDA, mm -hmm. family is not an option. Um, what it, what, right. what, so uh-huh. So when I, 
um, attempting to complete the Viaspidat. Um, I have one. I don't have his number in front of me. I have his name. I don't have his number. But um, when I attempted to complete the Viaspidat, the the blue option, you know, the family Viaspidat, it was not available at all. But when I attempted it on another family, different family, um, I could proceed with the assessment. It was available, so. Um, you give me that client name. Uh, Gary Ryder, R-I-D. Okay, um, so you go to Spadat, you went to VI and add new. Mm-hmm, okay. I see that there is a family, there was a family one done on 611 already. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if it's not gonna allow you, and if, uh, remind me if this is correct, if a family Viaspidat has already been done for this client's record, then a family VI option won't come available. Is that, isn't that correct, Frida? Only one Viaspidat, whether that's a TAY, whether that's a single Viaspidat, or whether that's a family Viaspidat, only one form of a Viaspidat should be done for a client. Um, so, Marsha, the reason you're not seeing that um, the option to do a family Viaspidat is because there's more than likely there's one that already exists. So if there's one that already exists, then you're not going to have the button to do it. I also want to. Um, we may need to talk about I know we're about to end the call, right? Um, Remember when you do a pass enrollment, that Viaspidat is included right in that pass enrollment. So if it's a family, it should automatically take you through the family Viaspidat. If there's a time, um, if you're not doing a CAS enrollment and for whatever reason you need to do a Viaspidat, then you would go to those menu options over on the left. If there's a Viaspidat that already exists for a client and the client has, has had a change in their situation, you would want right. to submit a help desk ticket for that the ask for that to be deleted so that you can perform the new one. OK, that makes sense. OK, thank you. So yeah, so for this client, uh, Marsha, if you were wanting to redo, redo a new one because something has changed and that yeah. is why, then yes, please go ahead and submit us a ticket asking us to remove this family one for this client and um, why you are why you are needing to recreate re redo a new one and we'll take it from there. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Marsha. Any other questions before we close out this meeting? We're at time. So to all of you who have been on um, this morning for the long haul. Thank you for attending, um, for your participation and your engagement and your patience as we work through some of these issues that we know are um, not super convenient, maybe a little frustrating at times. Um, when the system doesn't work the way it's supposed to do, we are also frustrated. So we feel that um, and we're, we're working hard to make sure that it gets updated for you guys. Uh, I'm putting the sign-in link in the chat again. If you would like to sign in for office hours today, please do so. Um, otherwise, I don't have any more topics for you all. I don't see any, any other questions coming in the chat, so I'm going to go ahead and end this meeting. We appreciate you all, and if you have any other questions, you can submit a Spiceworks ticket or attend office hours next week on Monday, I believe. So thank you all very much for joining, and I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday. Bye, everybody. Bye, Megan. Thanks.